Man, I took a week off, y'all, and I am ready to go. <laughs> amen, amen. Um, I'm so glad to see each and every one of you here this morning. We are starting a new message series this morning uh, called 167. So there are 168 hours in the week. So this moment starts, well, actually at 11 o'clock, you're going to start well, at 10 o'clock, you started 168. So at the end of the service, you have 167 hours left this week. And we are going to talk about what we do with that amount of time that God, the creator of the world, has given to us. This morning, we're, the way we are going to start is we're actually going to start talking about Sabbath. Has anybody heard this word, Sabbath? Apparently, in this building on Friday night, the Jewish folks had a Cinco de Mayo sh Sabbath service. I don't know what that means, but I want to be a part of the fiesta and all the tacos and things it looks like they had for Sabbath. But Sabbath is a time, it, it is a tradition that the, the, folks in, the folks of God started. It is still honored very, um, very closely by the folks who are Jewish. But it is a time that is set aside from our work and our normal lives to enjoy a different rhythm, the rhythm of God. We're going to talk about what that looks like why you need it, and what it is God offers to us in Sabbath. So um, I went to seminary at Vanderbilt University, Vanderbilt Divinity School. Seminary is essentially graduate school. They officially call it Divinity School. But it is essentially graduate school for people preparing to be pastors. I went, Chris went, Amy went. Um, so those of us who are preparing to be pastors or chaplains in, uh, in the church, we go to seminary. And one of the first classes that we take is on the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Um, and, you know, I, I'll be really honest, it's my very first class. I was not super excited about this particular class because um, all the stories that I knew in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, were kind of weird stories, you know. Um, I didn't understand them. I didn't know what it all meant. It, it just seemed a little weird. And the very first day... Of, um, of, of class, Dr. Sasson, who worked at the University of North Carolina. So he announces this, and it's my very first like moment in a seminary class with all these people who are studying to be like PhDs and stuff. And he was like, I, I taught at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I was like, woo, go Tar Heels! And he was like, that's how you get a C in my class. Interrupt, <laughs> Interrupt me in the very first sentence, right? Um, but anyway, uh, I was not... I, I appeared to be excited, but I wasn't super excited about being there. And, and this is how he started. He said that lots of people, lots of religious groups have stories about how the world was created. So we look around us and we see land masses and oceans and mountains and animals. And we have, we create these stories about how the world was created. They're like, you know, stories that you learn about in school. There's like some big turtle and it separates and that's how we get the continents. You learn about it raining for days and days. You learn about a volcano coming up. There are all of these stories about how the world begins, how it's created. And this is how he started that class. He said... Our story, our story doesn't begin with how these things we see around us were created. Our story connects us to the God who created time. It moved us beyond the things we could see and feel and touch and moved us into a different place, a different way of being. Our God created time. We're the only people who believe that story, that God reaches beyond what we see and where we move, and that our story, the story of God, pulls us to the God who created order out of chaos, who created, who created purpose in, in the midst of void, who set the sun and the moon in the sky, but before that created day and night. The God who created the world that we see first with a purpose. Before there was water and sea and sky and all of those things, God created purpose and he set a time, a motion in place. And a few days after God creates all of these things, humans were created, Adam and Eve, 
And they traded all of this good stuff, the, the time that God created, the, the world that God created, the animals that God created, the plants that God had created, the sea that God had created, all these wonderful and good things. And they traded it in one moment for something that was good enough, a fruit offered to them, tempted to them by the enemy. They traded what was good for good enough. And I bet most of us in here, that hits us somewhere in our heart this morning, right? How many of us this week have have traded something that God created good and wonderful for something good enough? How many of us have traded good, the good and wonderful things of God, for something good enough? This message series is particularly that, how we move from the good time, the good enough way that we use our time to the good and miraculous and creative and wonderful ways that God wants us to use to, to experience the gift that he has given us from time, of time. How we move from busy, hectic, and full lives to lives of deep purpose and deep meaning. Sorry, I've created quite the fold in my... How we move from from just the food in our mouths, from enjoying the things of creation, how we move from food in our mouths to meals that feed our souls, the deepest parts of what we need with conversation and bread. From naps and Netflix to rest, real rest for our weary souls. And it begins with this. It begins with this. If we want those 167 hours to matter, to move us from just good enough to the good and amazing and deeper things of the world, then a connect, we've got to connect to the God who desires to connect with us beyond what we see here, who wants to meet us in our deepest yearnings for purpose and community. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, I want, I want you to hear what it is that God, God does. The heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. So this is how, chapter, how, how it ends. And this, this is what it says. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all of the work of creating that he had done. God rested from the work of creating. A few verses later it tells us we were made in God's image. So if God was creating things in in this brilliant and wild dream that God had, if God was a creator, then we are created in an image to also be creating things. And then God rested from all of that creating. Honoring a Sabbath, setting 24 hours of your week. So what's 167 minus 24? I didn't do the math, sorry. But if you set that amount of time, there's got to, we got a church full of accountants. Somebody knows this number, right? <laughs> um, but if, if you will take that 24 hours and you will set it aside, set that, si- that, that aside and keep it, Keep it holy. Honoring a Sabbath moves us from consumption, a world where we are constantly consuming or producing for others to consume, and it moves us to creation. Connecting with God on the Sabbath moves us from consumption to creation. Those dreams in your hearts to create music or or wonderful things like we see Crystal and Clarissa do here each morning. From from moving from, from... you know, just setting out some fried chicken nuggets uh, for dinner and calling it, calling it dinner to moving to a time of meal, like creating a space for your family and your friends to enjoy time together. It moves us from, from, from the work of, of everyday life, showing up at 9 o'clock in the office and coming home at 5 or 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 o'clock at night, right? It moves us from a 60, 70, 80 hour week of producing and consuming all of the things to creating something that matters. Honoring a Sabbath connects us with the Creator, who we were made in His image and gives us the courage to be creators in a world that needs some new things. Can I get an amen? 
It moves us from consumption to creation. I remember in my own life that some of these meals that I have had with folks moved me from consumption and production to creation. I remember in Memphis, Tennessee, spending 10 weeks walking alongside women who were immigrants, who spoke English as their second language, who'd moved here, you know, four, three or four years before, who didn't know how to operate money or do any of those things. And I had spent weeks with them learning about English while I would give them like worksheets or help them. And then I'd play with their kids over in the corner of the room. We were working so hard for them to be able to just exist in a world that was so foreign and so weird to them. And at the end of my internship, they invited me over to their apartment, a one-bedroom apartment with six people living in it. I knew because I'd helped them grocery shop and budget and figure out all those things. I knew that food was a, a, a huge expense for them. And sometimes in the week, the math didn't always add up. And I remember them inviting me over to sit and eat a meal with them and their children. And I remember in that moment, we stopped. We stopped fighting all the injustice of this world, a world where people didn't speak English or couldn't figure out how to operate in this world, right? We stopped worrying about all the pain of that. We stopped worrying about what in the world the future would look like for these children playing in the corner of the room. And we sat together and we celebrated that in some mighty way, our God created the world with enough. Enough for us all. And for a moment, we didn't worry about how much the meal cost. We sat and we ate it together. They said some words that I didn't understand in their language. I said some stuff in English that I thought was funny and they didn't laugh. I hope it's because they didn't get it, you know. But we, for a few moments, we stopped fighting everything wrong in this world and we celebrated that God was creating community between strangers and foreigners. That God was creating something and we were a part of it. And that bread and that soup has never tasted so good. We move from simply putting things in our mouth, checking things off the grocery list, to having a meal that nourished something deeper. We moved from seeing what was to connecting with the God who created more than just what we see and experience, but, but creates this, this portal into something bigger and deeper and more spiritual. And it was good. It was very good. I remember in East Nashville about nine years ago, I sat at a table and ate Papa John's pizza with two people who had spent a decade living in their van or a tent, Michael and Stacy. He went by Bama because he was an Alabama fan. The real miracle is that my Florida Gator husband sat down with an Alabama football fan and that picture of, uh, of Bear Bryant was like on the you know, on their brand new apartment they had just gotten. Chris is like, this is the worst. Uh, I'm like, they've not had permanent housing in a decade and you're worried about Bear Bryant on the wall. Um, but we, we sat and I, I brought over pizza and we had some salad together. Bear Bryant watched us uh, eat this meal together. They had spent 10 years bouncing around, never ever having permanent housing. And we sat down and we ate that pizza and we enjoyed that God was creating a home and an affordable apartment for them. We moved from good, good enough, you know, where they had come to our house and enjoyed some stuff with us on occasion, to their home, and it was good. It was very, very good. We, we rested from all of the paperwork that it took to get there, from all of the, the AA and NA meetings that I had drug Bama to, from all of those things. We moved from that to just celebrating that God is creating a new day in their lives and in our world. We moved from consuming to creation and celebrating what it is that God was doing. I was starting a new church in East Nashville at this, uh, about this same time, and we had um, on the, the, thir the Sunday before Thanksgiving, the Sunday night before Thanksgiving, after the dinner, after the church service, we had a dinner, and we called it East Banksgiving, you know, kind of like Thanksgiving, and we had all of these kids and moms in public housing. We had, um, 
you know, folks from all over the community. Like, there were literally 150 people in this worship service, and then afterwards we all shared a meal together. We had fought for, for housing, for sobriety. We had fought for them to have... It, a turkey on, on Thanksgiving four days later. We had worked hard and fought. We had worked and prayed and fought for funding for this church to continue going. We had been reading all summer long to prevent the summer slide for these kids. We had been working so, so hard. And on this Sunday night after the worship service, we, we pulled the chairs back and we set tables out and we enjoyed a meal given to us by a local restaurant. And we just sat around and we enjoyed this meal together. And we celebrated that God was creating community. Some powerful bonds that were more powerful than all the things that try to separate us. And we celebrated that God is indeed creating. And this is what I realized. That so much of my life I have spent working, 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 hustling, 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 making it work, making it work. Y'all spent time with me. You know how I am. Come, come early on a Sunday morning. You'll see. I, you know, I'm just making it happen. And when I take a step back and I connect with the Creator, I realize God is using us not to set up chairs and, and screens and all of these things, but to worship, to connect with the Creator of the world who created us for something beyond coffee and donuts, but who created us for the community and the conversations that we have where we celebrate sobriety, where we celebrate redemption, where we celebrate second chances, when we celebrate that we have stepped beyond the hang-ups that have held us back for so long. This is what happens on Sabbath. We connect to the Creator and we move into this larger space beyond what we can see. It moves us from consumption to creation. In Exodus chapter 20, after the people of Israel have marched across the wilderness and are waiting to walk into the promised land, and they have traded the good, the good freedom of God for good enough, and they've created idols, and they've not honored the Sabbath, and they've ate food they're not supposed to eat. When they continued to trade good enough for the good and real stuff, Moses goes up, he has this holy moment with God, and he comes back down and he says, There's ten things that God wants to offer us to do in this world so that we can live different, so that we quit trading good for good enough. And he says this, remember the Sabbath day. He reminds them just a few chapters later, remember the Sabbath day, 24 hours to rest from your work and life as normal. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor, you shall work hard, creating new things and doing amazing work. Do all of your work. But the seventh day, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. It's a gift that we get and give to God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. If God can make all the heavens and the earth in six days, then surely to goodness y'all can do what you need to. Right? He, he made the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Moses didn't say surely to goodness. Um, Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy. See, this is what was happening. They were running from the Egyptians who worked seven days really hard. They, they were running from, from an army that, that used them, oppressed them, made them work seven days, 24 hour, hours a day, and they said there is a good way to do things and we're only going to work six days. We don't need manna on the seventh day, God. We're going to actually set that time aside and keep it holy because this is what they did. They knew when, when Moses came down and said to them, we are going to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy for 24 hours. We are going to live differently. They moved from hustle to holy. From hustle to holy. Some of y'all are sitting here and you're exhausted. You're tired and you're weary because you've been hustling. You've been trying to make it work. Just because you don't work a 40-hour week job does not mean you're not hustling. So some of y'all in here, listen to me. The Sabbath, taking some time away, 24 hours a, a week, moving that aside, moves us from hustle to holy. 
God worked hard creating and doing amazing things for six days. God is not saying don't work hard and be lazy. God is saying for six days it was hard work to create the world. And then we only allow ourselves ten minutes on a Sunday afternoon to enjoy this beautiful creation God has given us. We only give ourselves a 15-minute time in the morning to connect with the Word of God. All of these wonderful and good things we just trade for good enough. It's good enough to have 15 minutes with God. It's good enough to spend three minutes outside. It's good enough to, to spend 10 minutes a, a week off. No. God says let's move from that hustle to a holy life, separate and different. And this is what happens. People later on, when, when they're living in exile, when they're, when they're living in Jerusalem, later on when they're living in America, and we're, it's not even made it to the Bible, right? When they're living like this, people say there's something different about you. And they're like, yeah, because we're connecting to the creator of the world. And it connects us to our own ability to create, our own purpose, and our own goodness. It moves us from hustle, the hustle, to holy. And finally... Jesus, I want to read you the words of Jesus in Mark. So, so Sabbath moves us from, from, um, from consumption to creating. It moves us from hustle to holiness. And then I want you... Uh-oh, I lost it. I'm going to read it from up here. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. One Sabbath, so on the Sabbath day that they were supposed to keep holy, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick up some heads of grain. So it's the Sabbath, they pick up some heads of grain. The Pharisees, who followed the rule in the tradition perfect, said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? God asked us not to do this. And he, he said, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? And in need, in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and he ate the consecrated bread. Bread that was set aside just for the holy worship service. He snuck inside, he ate it, which is lawful only for priests to eat. He was not supposed to do this. And he also gave some to his companions. So he ate it and then he shared it with his companions. And this is what Jesus says to them. The Sabbath was made for humans. That's what he would have said. They said man. But it's made for all of us, okay? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is what it tells us. The Pharisees are, are judging the disciples for feeding themselves when they're hungry on the Sabbath. The, the, they're hungry, right? They're, they're not supposed to deny their hunger. They're not supposed to deny that they need stuff. They move from burden to blessing. This is what Jesus says. I don't want the Sabbath to be a burden. I want it to be a blessing. I don't want you worried and anxious that you are taking time off of work or stepping away from the normal rhythm of your life. I want it to be a blessing. I want to connect with you. I want to tell you how loved you are. I want to whisper my purpose over you and to you and through you. I want the Sabbath to be about blessing. It's not about doing one more thing. It's not about the weight of avoiding important tasks. It's not about proving you are right or just because you do it. It is about freedom and blessing. It is about trading the good enough life of working all the time, hustling all the time, looking and dreaming about the future all the time, and it is about being free and present in the moment. It is about freedom and blessing. It is about trading good enough for good and wonderful. We live in a world desperate for you all to be connected to the good things of God. There are people who are hungry and lonely. There are people at your work who have no idea what it might look like to spend 24 hours with the creator of the world. There are children in your lives that you are forming or teaching who need to know there's a different way to live than the one that's been modeled for us. There are hurting people who need to be noticed and not hustled by because we have something else to do. And your weary souls, your hurting and grieving souls, your hung up and shameful selves, your hearts longing for something that matters, they need to connect to the Creator who loves you 
and created you not to be not to be hung up on so many other things, not to be you know chained back to all these other things, but free to shine light and ignite change in a dark, desperate, and hopeless world. There is a new day, and in God's time it will dawn. I need to ask you this morning: What does it look like? For your 167 hours from this moment forward, for 24 of those to be given to God. You're like, I've got kids, there's no way I can rest. I get it, Uh, trust me, I do. But I'm asking you, what does it look like for you and your family to just live in a different rhythm for 24 hours? You get to sleep for eight or nine of those, right? What does it look like just this week for you to find 24 hours where you can honor the Sabbath, where you can connect to the Creator who created you for good and amazing things? who may offer you a point to stop in the middle of all the amazing things that you are already creating and allow you to celebrate, right? It was a good thing to get to do that at East Bank Church on that East Thanksgiving. For us to celebrate that God had brought together black and white, poor and rich, single moms and single dads, all the people were together worshiping God. It was good to celebrate that only God could create something like that. And we miss those moments when we keep hustling through life. What does it look like for 24 of the next 167 hours to be given unto God and connect with the Sabbath that He wants to give to you? The blessing of freedom and goodness. Can I pray for you? God, I thank you for each of these people. Thank you for Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. I thank you for holiness and righteousness that you offer to us even in the face of our hustle and hurry. I thank you for goodness and comfort and peace that you offer to us even in grief. I thank you for the joy and celebration you offer us when the world tells us to keep on running. I thank you for this group of believers who takes an hour on Sunday morning to honor you. And I thank you, God, that you've already prepared a blessing for us this morning. And you ask us only to open ourselves up and to claim it. We pray, God, that as these people connect to you, the Creator, that they will begin creating things that change this world for the new day that you do indeed create and author. I pray for the hungry and the hurting, the hopeless and the homeless, the desperate and the lonely, the lost, And I pray that these people, so connected to you, the God of the Sabbath, so connected to Jesus who frees us up to live a new life, will shine your light and ignite your change for people desperate for it. Amen.